Okay, everybody, this is Moody Dashcam, and today we're in East Northport in Long Island, Nassau County, and we're going to be talking about Salvatore Avellino, also just known as Sal. He was a Lucchese captain. He was pretty much the right hand man to the boss, Tony Ducks, which I'm sure if you're familiar with the mob, you're familiar with Tony Ducks. All right, so let's get into it. The address we are going to today is 41 Brightside Avenue. It is, it was an office for a garbage truck company. Now we're right now, we're in the neighborhood behind that address, just so I could kill some time, so I could tell you the story before we get there. So the story is pretty, uh, you know, it, it's a little complicated, but I simplified it for the most part. So for about 15 years, um, Sal ran and controlled Long Island's waste management rackets with his younger brother Carmine and his son Michael. They pretty much ran threats. They controlled almost everything that went on. Who was able to put in bids for contracts, how much they were able to bid, they'd scare people off so they couldn't bid at all, stuff like that. Whoever was in the business had pretty much had to go through them. And law enforcement was catching on to this as law enforcement should, I mean, come on, come on now. If a mobster's running all the, a whole business in a whole part of New York, they should know. So, in the winter of 1980, uh, an organized crime task force contacts Robert Kubeka and Donald Barstow, who are in the garbage truck business, the waste management business, and say, hey, do you want to inform? Do you want to be involved in this investigation against these guys that have been torturing your business for a long time now? And they promised them up and down all types of protection, that if they were to do this for them, they would, um, their identities would be kept a secret and they'd be kept out of the uh, public eye and the law enforcement would do most of the work and it wouldn't really be on them much. So they figure just being regular businessmen that are tortured by some mobsters, understandably so, they agree. It's a risky decision, but they agree. Now, this is how crazy they were. He actually, Sal uh, Avellino actually ordered in 1983, ordered his son-in-law and his son to go and burn down a competitor's garbage truck business. Kids always go slow when there's kids around people. Oh, of course we're getting rain, but it's kind of pretty if we're gonna agree. Um, yeah, he's even quoted saying, whoever stays in there is only who we allow to stay in there, talking about the garbage truck business. That's how much control he wanted over it. Which I get it if you want if you want to make a lot of money, that's a good way to do it. Um so obviously the Law enforcement is coming down hard on Avellino. He, I'm sure he knows and I'm sure he feels it from every direction. As this is all going on, um, he's caught on recording threatening Robert Kubeka. This is a bunch of times he's caught on recording. So there's evidence that he is running this racket in Long Island. Now, in 1986, he pleads guilty on conspiracy charges to these crimes. Now he knows, I believe he gets a tip, I'm sure he knows everyone around, so he knows that it's this dude, Robert Kubeka, and his partner, Donald, that are the ones that are that are, have recorded everything. And he doesn't want them to testify. He doesn't want them to bring up new evidence and get him in more trouble. So he goes out and asks, in 1986, he asks, Anthony Gaspacasso, who I just pretty much a few videos back did a video on. Um, he asked him for permission to kill Kubeka, afraid that he'd bring up new evidence. After the mafia for years tortured, ran threats by, and harassed Robert Kubeka, his family, and all of his employees, and his business. I mean, it was never ending. I believe it was about 12 years. I read that somewhere that he was um, bothered by the mafia. So you can see how that get a little bit tiring. Now, on August 10th, 1989, 
So a couple years later, they had a whole plan set up. They had a few guys drive them. They staked out the area. This is not on August 10th, this is the pre-planning. They stake out the area. They find out the two guys' homes. They, they kind of rule out that a hit can't happen at the homes because it's not enough cover. It's just not a good area, not a good enough way to get away. So they kind of settle on the office. And the office is kind of a good area. You'll see why. We're going to pull up there in a minute here. It's kind of an industrial street. No one really around. And it's a good spot to get this kind of thing done. So, August 10th, 1989 at 6 a.m. They have guys drop them off and obviously wait there for them. But the two guys that actually got out and carried out the hit are Rocco Vitulli and Frankie the Pearl Federico. Federico, not Federico, sorry. And um, it was 6 a.m. They bust in. The first person they see in the hallway is Donald Barstow. Actually, they weren't going after, but he was in there anyway, so it didn't make a difference to them. They were on a, they were on a mission. Shot him dead right there because they caught him by surprise. There was nothing he could really do. They end up getting to Quebec's office, and he puts up a struggle. He puts up a fight. There's actually bullet holes in the ceiling and the floor, and even Frankie the Pearl got hit and got injured. I don't know if he got shot exactly, but I know that he was injured in the struggle. This turn here and then they ended up putting a few shots in Robert and he was slumped over a desk and they got out of there now what they left in there was Frankie the Pearl's puddle of blood and two guns in a duffel bag big big no-no of course you don't want to leave anything behind but you know you can't plan for the unexpected now um, Robert Kubeka wasn't actually dead he wasn't killed. They didn't know that, of course. I'm sure they'd want to they'd want to finish the job. This is the office right here. I'm assuming those that oh let's put the finger right that door right there is probably the office door. I don't know for sure. Maybe they went around the back. I don't know. But this is the place that this all took place. You can see it's like a desolate little road here. There are some houses over to the right. Um to the right we're in the neighborhood. But yeah, it's a, it's a little spot you could get away from quickly. <clears throat> so they didn't they didn't kill him. He was alive on the desk. I'm sure he was really badly injured. He calls 911, gives a slight description. He says uh, two white men in their 40s. Meanwhile, I believe one was in their 30s and one was in their 60s actually, carrying out the hit. And he goes to the hospital and he gives a little bit more of a description on the way to the hospital in the hospital. But later that morning, he dies. Um, like I said, Donald Barstow dies in the spot. And then after this, they shoot off to a safe house, make sure everything's kind of uh, under control, and then they both go off to their separate areas to lay low for a little while after that. Now, almost everybody involved in this crime went to jail. Anthony Gaspar Casso, Salvatore Avellino, um... Rocco Vitulli, Frankie the Pearl, and a, a couple more. It was not, um, pretty, they pretty much all went to jail after uh, Gaspipe Casso gave all the information that he gave. So then, after this, in 1993, Sal is indicted on racketeering and the Quebeca and Barstow murders. He pleads guilty to the murders in 94, sentenced to 10 years, which seems um, a little bit light of a sentence, 10 years for two murders, but I'm sure there was a reason for it at the time, who knows. And then in 1999, he was indicted again while he was in prison on 15 counts of racketeering. That was in 2001. He got sentenced again um, to five more years. So in 2006, he was released. And then the families of Kubeka and Barstow went after the state, the government, saying that they were promised protection and the people that they were promised protection against 
came and killed them. You know, I, you'd be pretty uh, pissed off is the least uh, extreme word I could think of. But you'd be pretty upset. So the family's got 10.8 million. Not that that's enough for someone's life, but it is a lot of money. It would be 17 million now. And that was for the New York State failing to protect their witnesses, their informants at the time. So yeah, that's pretty much everything I have to tell you about this hit that Salvatore Avellino carried out, not carried out, okayed, and it was carried out by Rocco and Frankie the Pearl. All right, I will see you guys in the next one.